you will be rewarded. Today I want to talk to you. Normally when we give a sermon or a split sermon or a sermonette, we try to avoid addressing the audience with you, but rather speak of we, including all of us. And of course, this sermon will certainly include me as well. But I want to make it very personal. And I want to talk to you, quite personally, quite individually. You will be rewarded. You see, God is not unfaithful that he should forget your sacrifices, what you have given to him, that you have given your life to him, that you are working on overcoming, that you are serving him. God will not forget that. Man might forget the good things you are doing. God never will. And God is promising you that he will reward you. I like to start with the end of the book. Because as Mr. Armstrong has said so many, many times, when you read the end of the book, you know that you will win. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 22. And let's look at verse 12. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. This is what Jesus Christ is telling us. And as we heard in the first split sermon, this is inevitable. Behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me. To give to everyone according to his work. I'm not taking the time right now to make the distinction and explain the distinction between works and gifts and the gift of eternal life and the works dependent, or the reward rather dependent on works and all that. I expect you to know that. That's not the purpose of the sermon today. The purpose is to show you that you are going to be Rewarded. Notice Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18. Another inevitable promise. Revelation 11 and verse 18. The nations were angry. And your wrath has come. That's what we heard about in the first message today. And the time of the dead, it says here, it should say nations, the time of the nations, that they should be judged, notice, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great. And yes, and you should destroy those who destroy the earth. God's wrath will be poured upon those, but Insofar as you are concerned, Christ will reward you as one of his servants, as one of his saints. Notice Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. There is something you must do. It says, by faith, or rather without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Make it personal. You must believe that God exists, that he is watching you, that he knows everything about you, and you must believe that he will reward you when you diligently seek him. Since we are in the book of Hebrews, let's look at verse 24 in the same chapter. Hebrews 11, 
verses 24 to 26. By faith, Moses, when he became, an age, became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Again, make it personal. As Moses chose affliction over sin, since he looked to the reward, so must you. Let's go to Second John. Second John, and let's notice verse eight. Second John, and verse eight. It says, look to yourselves that we, or that you, do not lose those things we have worked for, but that we, you, may receive a full reward. So make sure that you do not lose your reward. Make sure that you receive a full reward. Reward that tells you something, doesn't it? It is possible to lose your reward. Make sure that that doesn't happen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 8. You want to make sure that you receive your full reward, not just a portion of it. First John chapter, I'm sorry, First Corinthians chapter three and verse eight. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse eleven. No other foundation can anyone lay, that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 14, if anyone works, or if anyone's work, which he has built on it, on that foundation, if that endures, he will receive a reward. So putting it together, what Paul is saying here. Receive your own reward, not the reward of somebody else. Your own reward according to your own labor, not the labor of somebody else. But is that labor which needs to endure, and it's going to endure, if you are building it on the true foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Let's notice 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verses 16 to 18. One of these passages I am submitting to you is one which is difficult to understand. But I want to just focus on one aspect which is clear to understand. Notice what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 to 18. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. What is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. Now, what I want you to take from this passage is this. When you willingly and humbly do your work, you will receive a reward. Willingly, humbly doing your 
work. First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 18. Very famous passage. Apply it to yourself. For the scripture says, an Old Testament passage Paul is referring to as scripture. You shall not muscle an ox while it treads out the grain. And the laborer is worthy of his wages, of his reward in the Greek. As a laborer, you are worthy of your wages, of your reward. If you are a laborer, for God. Notice Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive your reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Again, for your work, you will receive from God the reward of the inheritance. Entering eternal life, entering the kingdom of God, in the Greek it literally says, you will receive from God a giving back again of the inheritance. God is paying you back for what you are doing, if you are doing it. In Matthew chapter 5, let's notice verses 11 and 12. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Happy are you. When they revile and persecute you. And they say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice. Be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Not to be in a bad company. Great is our reward in heaven. Which Christ is going to bring back with him when he comes. Rather than being all depressed when others don't accept us for what we believe, what we stand for, when they start lying about us, when they start persecuting us, when they start speaking against us, we should be happy. Because we know that God will pay us back for our standing up for him. Persecution for righteousness sake brings you great reward in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. When you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed, verse 4, may be in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will himself reward you openly. Verse 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Accordingly, I say to you, they have their reward. They have the recognition from men. But you, verse 6, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And look at this example in verse 16. Moreover, when you fast, 
Do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. God rewards you when, do you, when, do, when you do your good works and your religious duties in secret, without expecting thanks, recognition, praise from other people. In Luke chapter 14, but keep your finger in Matthew, but in Luke chapter 14, he adds another interesting point. Luke chapter 14 and verse 14. He says, you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, those people whom you're doing good to. They can't repay you. They're not in a position to repay you. God says, you will be blessed if you do it because they cannot repay you for you shall be repaid. You see, rewarded by God when at the resurrection of the just. The whole theme is don't do it so that you receive praise and honor and glory and recognition from other men. Don't even do it to men in this regard. Do it to God and he will repay you. Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 to 42. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 40. Christ says, he who receives you, receives me. And he who receives me, receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet, in the name of a prophet, shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man, in the name of a righteous man, shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water, in the name of a disciple. Assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. What's the lesson? Accepting or helping a godly person brings you lasting reward without ever losing it. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27. Matthew 16 and verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then, not necessarily prior to then, but then he will reward each according to his works. Our reward is in fact dependent on how we are doing. But we will be rewarded. You will be rewarded when Christ comes in glory. Let's go to the book of Proverbs in chapter 25. Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 and 22. We heard about warfare earlier today. Look, the Bibles, look at the Bible's answer here. Look at what God has to say about it. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. 
Help your enemy. And God will reward you. Christ says, love your enemies. And you will be repaid. At the time of the resurrection. Of the just. Notice Proverbs chapter 11. And verse 18. Proverbs 11. And verse 18. It says, the wicked man does deceptive work. But to him who sows righteousness will be a sure reward. Your reward will be sure. Absolutely certain. Inevitable. If you sow righteousness for yourselves, for others. Notice Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 13. Proverbs 13 and verse 13. Do you see how the prior message goes absolutely hand in hand with this one? And we hadn't talked about that. He who despises the word will be destroyed. But he who fears or respects the commandment will be rewarded. You will be rewarded if you fear or respect God's commandments. Psalm 19 and verse 11 echoes what we've just read. Psalm 19 and verse 11. Here David is talking about God's commandments. He says, moreover, by them your servant is warned. He is warned not to transgress them. He is warned not to engage in conduct which is against God's law. He says, and in keeping them there is great reward. You will receive great reward which is being stored up in heaven at this point if you keep God's commandments. Psalm 58. Psalm 58 and verse 11. I know there are theologians out there who try to argue with all of this. Oh, well, God's gift of eternal life is just an unconditional gift and you have nothing to do. Do all those scriptures we are reading here confirm that? Look at Psalm 58 and verse 11. Psalm 58 and verse 11. Men will say, they don't say it now mostly, but they will, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely he is God who judges in the earth. There is a reward for you when you are righteous. Notice Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 16. This is talking to you when you are in tough situations, when you feel kind of hopeless, you are in despair. God is saying to you, refrain your voice from weeping. Refrain your eyes from tears. For your work shall be rewarded says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. Your work will be rewarded. Keep that always in mind when you are going through tough times. God is, as I said, not unfaithful that he should forget. Notice in Isaiah chapter 62, David even says in one of the Psalms, that God stores the very tears you are shedding. He writes all the things in your life in a book. He is not going to forget. 
Isaiah 62 and verse 11. Isaiah 62 and verse 11. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, Say to the daughter of Zion, Surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Your salvation, your reward is coming. But you won't cease from working. In fact, when Christ returns, our real work will begin. But it's coming. Your salvation and your reward. And that too is inevitable. Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 4. Isaiah 49 and verse 4. These are sometimes the thoughts you might have. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing. In vain, it's all useless. Yet surely, it goes on to say, my just reward is with the Lord. My work is with my God. He knows. There's another way of translating that passage, by the way. The Lamsar translation has here, Then I said, I have not labored in vain. I have not spent my strength for nothing in vain, because I know that my just reward is with the Lord. Either way, it makes sense. Sometimes you might have a moment of despair, but then you've got to remind yourself, no, no, but wait, it's not in vain, because God is just. He will repay me. He will give me my reward when Jesus Christ returns. Notice Second Chronicles chapter 15. Second Chronicles chapter 15. And in verse 7. That's what God is telling you. Take it very personally. But you be strong. Do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. Even in times of trial, of trouble, keep on going. Be strong. Notice in 1 Samuel chapter 24 what Saul had to recognize and what he told David. And it was almost a prophecy. In fact, it was one. And we can apply that to ourselves. You can apply it to your life. What David did, not necessarily what Saul did. First Samuel chapter 24 and verse 17. See, Saul had gone out to kill David. David was given an opportunity to kill Saul. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. And Saul recognized that. And notice what he says in 1 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 17. Then he said to David, you are more righteous than I. For you have rewarded me with good. Whereas I have rewarded you with evil. And you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? Therefore may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And then he also recognized that, of course, the kingship would be with David. Let the, war, let the Lord reward you with good for the things you are doing. God will reward you. Your righteousness. When you do good. Even to those who may want to hurt you. Notice in the book of Ruth. Going back to the book of Ruth. 
the one who ultimately ended up in the lineage of producing David. I mean, not that she produced David, but of course she was one of the four fathers. Ruth chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Ruth chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And Boaz answered and said to her, to Ruth, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth, and have come to a people whom you didn't know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Beautiful, beautiful statement. God will give you a full reward for the good deeds you are doing for others and for your submission to God that he is becoming your refuge and not anyone or anything else. Let's go back to the book of Genesis chapter 15. And notice another beautiful statement which God made to Abraham. Genesis 15 and verse 1. Genesis 15 and verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. God is your exceedingly great reward. Or as the New Jerusalem Bible says, I shall give you a very great reward. So don't be afraid. See, our reward comes from God. That's why God says, I am your reward. It doesn't come from people. If we are looking for reward from people, we have our reward. But it's not the reward we are looking forward to, or should be, receiving it from God. But now notice 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. We're getting a lot of scriptures today in both messages. Consider them carefully. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. Here are people who also receive a reward. But that's not the reward you want to receive. Second Peter 2 and verse 13, they will receive the wages of unrighteousness. Those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They receive wages, the same word, reward, but that's the reward you don't want. You don't want to be an evildoer who will receive the reward for unrighteousness. You know, there's a very famous scripture, I don't know how many millions of times you might have quoted it over the years, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. And I still like to quote it in this context. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. In the Greek, the reward for sin is death. The eternal death. The second death. The death from which there is no resurrection. The wages of unrighteousness. The wages of sin is death. But notice how it goes on. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wages, what you do, can either be positive or negative. But God gives you eternal life. Now he also gives you a reward. You shouldn't forget that either. But here's a context and a contrast. 
The wages, the reward of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Now notice Luke chapter 12. And verse 32. Luke chapter 12 and verse 32. Think about it. The gift of God is eternal life. Luke chapter 12, verse 32, do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, to give you eternal life, to give you the kingdom of God, to make you an immortal member of the kingdom or family of God. Don't fear, little flock. And he's talking as I mentioned before, he's not talking about millions upon millions of people in these huge, big organizations which call themselves Christians. The true church of God was never such a huge, big organization. And won't be until the return of Christ. No, you are belonging to a little flock. And he says, don't fear. Because it is you whom God wants to give the kingdom. In Luke chapter 20, verses 35 and 36. Remember that we read, a laborer is worthy of his wages, of his reward. Notice what it says, Luke chapter 20 and verse 35. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age... And the resurrection from the dead, the resurrection of the just. Well, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels, are the sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. You are to be counted worthy to receive eternal life and God's reward. How do you do that? What's required? Notice first of all something very important in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now we don't preach an immortal soul. We don't preach that you have an immortal soul, that anybody has an immortal soul. The Bible nowhere says that the soul is immortal. But we do preach, or always have preached, this. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 16. Notice it carefully. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 16. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. So in order to be given everlasting life, you need to believe on Christ, in Christ. There is no other way to obtain eternal life than through Jesus Christ. I don't care how many religions there are. I don't care how many people are saying something different. There is no way to come to the Father than through Christ. There is no way for you and for me to obtain and being granted everlasting life unless we believe to begin with in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. But of course, it doesn't stop here. Turn to John chapter 3 and verse 36. John chapter 3 and verse 36. These are Christ's words. He who believes in the Son, notice, has, not will have, not is going to have, has everlasting life. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who doesn't believe in the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Now, the correct translation has it this way, and the RSV has it correctly. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not obey 
the Son. A different word here than the word for believe in the first part of that section. The one who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who doesn't obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. When you believe in Christ, you have everlasting life. But believing means and includes obeying him. We are not talking about theoretical belief. We are talking about the fact that your works show that you believe. And you can only do that if you have God's Holy Spirit. And that's why you have everlasting life. The Holy Spirit being a down payment. A guarantee. As long as you have the Holy Spirit, you have everlasting life. Christ says, even if he dies, he shall not die, you see. Now, it's important we understand this because of some other things Christ is saying. First John chapter 5. First, first John chapter 5, and let's look at verse 11. First John chapter 5 and verse 11. Again, very clearly put. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. But it doesn't stop here. And that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God, indicating that we still can lose it. That we still can lose our rewards. That we still can lose eternal life. Even though we have it. But what does Christ say? The one who endures until the end shall be saved. Matthew 24 and verse 13. Now turn with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly, in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, personally, you need to be diligent to make your calling and election sure, and God will give you an abundant, a rich entrance into his everlasting kingdom. Or, as the New Jerusalem Bible says, you will be given the generous gift of entry to the eternal kingdom. But notice again. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And in verse 46. Acts chapter 13 and verse 46. And Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said. It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Don't judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, unworthy of your rewards unworthy of the kingdom of God. There will be an accounting. And since I make it personally, there will be an accounting for you. Many scriptures tell us that. I'm just referring to them now. In Matthew chapter 25, we read that Christ will come back to settle accounts with you. We read in Matthew 12 that you, I mean you, 
have to give account for every idle word which you have said. Romans 14 tells you that you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give account of yourself to God. Hebrews 4 says that you, you are not hidden from God's sight to whom you will have to give account. I'd like to give you the scriptures right now without turning to them. You might want to look at them later. Matthew 25, verse 19. Matthew 12, verse 36. Romans 4, verses 10 and 12. And Hebrews 4 and verse 13. You will have to give account. There is an accounting coming. Now God gives you eternal life as a gift. But you can lose that gift. God gives you your reward when you stay committed. But you can lose that reward. You see, in Matthew chapter 25, he reads this very famous passage where God deals with his servants, where he is actually holding them accountable for what they have done. And when it comes to the unprofitable servant, in Matthew chapter 25, notice what he says to him and about him in verse 29. First he says in verse 28, therefore takes the talent from him. He gave him one talent, he didn't use it, get, take it from him. Give it to him who has ten talents. Verse 29, for to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have abundance. Didn't we read about that we will receive entrance into the kingdom of God abundantly? He will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. You can look at the parallel scripture in Luke chapter 19 and verse 26 where the same is stated. Even what he has will be taken away. Now, what is it what that servant had? What is it what you have now if God's Holy Spirit is within you? Notice the warning in Revelation chapter 2 and in verse 25. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 25, a warning of Christ to his church. Hold fast what you have till I come. And to make it even clearer in chapter 3 of Revelation and verse 11. Revelation 3 and verse 11, he says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Now what crown is that? It's a crown of eternal life. Be faithful until death, Paul says. And also Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, and Christ will give you the crown of life. And we also read in 1 Peter, that God will give you the crown of glory that doesn't fade away. But the warning is, hold fast what you have that no one shall take your crown. That unprofitable servant had something, eternal life, as we have seen. But it's taken away from him. And with it, the reward is taken away from him. And he won't receive anything. In fact, he will be thrown into uttermost darkness, thrown into the lake of fire. You will be rewarded. No doubt about it. Make sure it's the full reward of the righteous person. Make sure it's not the reward you don't want to see. <laughs>